Hi everyone, my name is Raif Darazi, and in this video, I'm excited to interview our special guest, Dr. Marcus Conant, to discuss his groundbreaking work in HIV, both at the height of the epidemic in the early 80s and continuously on through today with groundbreaking HIV cure research, most notably related to American Gene Technology's recent announcement of their AGT-103T phase one clinical trial results. If you haven't seen the video where I covered the announcement, I'll put up a card here so you can watch that as well. But first, I'll start by introducing our esteemed guest, Marcus A. Conant, MD, is a physician who treated thousands of HIV patients in the early 80s while running the inpatient dermatology service at the University of California, San Francisco. Before anyone recognized the virus or understood that it was about to become a global epidemic, he took the lead in forming the Kaposi Sarcoma Research and Education Foundation in 1982, which later became the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Marcus conducted early clinical trials, persevering despite seeing 94% of patients die during the epidemic's first years. His clinical experience sensitized him to the suffering caused by the disease. As a physician with a holistic perspective, his work expanded beyond the strictly clinical to include education, research, and advocacy. Marcus is currently a clinical professor emeritus at the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco. He has published more than 70 articles on the treatment of AIDS, testified in front of Congress multiple times, and is a powerful advocate for the LGBTQ community. He is currently the chief medical officer at both American Gene Technologies and Atomium. Dr. Conant, you have such an incredibly storied legacy and career, and in doing my research, I was just in awe of all that you've accomplished and the inner conviction you must have had to wade through so many challenges. It's so great to have you on the channel. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start with a really wide general question that I ask a lot of my guests, which is, what is your view on the current state of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? Uh, it's not been good from the beginning, and it's not good right now. <clears throat> As you know, probably better than I, there are more than 38 million people living with HIV infection worldwide right now, approaching 40 million. In addition to that, there have been 40 million people who have died of HIV. So we've got 80 million people infected with this disease. Unfortunately, I can remember in the early 80s when the CDC announced the first 1,000 patients that they knew of who had been infected. So I've lived through the period when we knew of a thousand people worldwide infected with this disease to now 40 million people, half of them dead. So the, the prevalence is, is huge. But the bad news is the incidence, the number of new cases is not going down or leveling off. Around in many places in the world, it's increasing. Now it's doing pretty well in the US, but around the world, it's continuing to increase. So the challenges that we've had since the beginning of the epidemic are one, a vaccine or some way to block infection, and then a treatment for people who are infected to eliminate the virus from their system. So I guess I'll start at the beginning and ask how, because you were a dermatologist at the time, how did you originally get involved in HIV work? My research at, at the university was on another sexually transmitted disease, genital herpes. And I, when I got there as a resident in 1963, uh, I volunteered at the Haight-Ashbury Clinic. And that was during the summer of love. And we started seeing all these cases of genital herpes, young people having sex, God forbid, and they were getting genital herpes. So I had spent my career up to that point doing clinical research on herpes. And a dear friend, Al Friedman Keen, was a dermatologist in New York, and he too was working on genital herpes, a dermatologist. And Al called me, it was on April the 1st of 1981, and said, Mark, we, we now have seen about 20 gay men in New York with Kaposi's sarcoma. And the amazing thing is they're young. Now we, we as dermatologists knew what Kaposi's sarcoma was because Kaposi, was an Austrian dermatologist who had described the disease uh, in the early eight, uh, in the late 1800s. And so we, we knew what it was, but it was exceedingly rare. The average dermatologist would probably see one case in a career. And suddenly here, Al had 23 of them in New York. 
And furthermore, they, they were in young people. Most of the cases of Kapsi sarcoma were in elderly Eastern, Jew, Eastern European Jewish men. So there was a demographic, and this wasn't that demographic. So the next day, I was doing, giving a lecture on herpes, but one of the herpes viruses had been implicated as the etiological agent of Kapsi sarcoma. And so at the end of the lecture, I mentioned this call from Friedman Keene. And wasn't this weird that they were seeing all these patients? And one of the dermatologists in the audience raised his hands and says, I have one of these upstairs. So that was the first case that I saw in 1981. And so at that point, that's how I became interested uh, in the disease. And it, it moved very quickly to realize that we had an epidemic because the number of cases started growing exponentially. And at what point was that connection made between the Kaposi sarcoma and and these young gay men who were who had AIDS? Yeah, right. We began to suspect it about four months later when cases from Los Angeles were reported with pneumocystis carinia and pneumonia. And very quickly, we learned with the KS patients and the patients with PCP that what, what they had in common was they were young gay men, they were sexually very sexually active gay men, and if, when we looked at it, all of their immune system had collapsed. Their T cell number was depressed. So it took a while for the community to understand what was going on, but I think among people working in the area, we realized pretty early that these were two manifestations of the same disease. In your work in dermatology, did this discovery of the immune suppression in in folks living with AIDS and then having Kaposi sarcoma as a result, did that inform your understanding of, of dermatology as it relates to immune function and immune health moving forward? Well, we I think we already knew a lot about that because remember, in dermatology, of course, encompasses a huge area. They're pediatric dermatologists and they're, believe it or not, infectious disease dermatologists. And so as a dermatologist, we those of us working in infectious diseases, in my case, genital herpes, we knew how the immune system um, determined the, the, the progression of that disease, the eruption of the disease, the, the treatment of the disease. So, yeah, we had begun to understand that. Now, we've lear learned a huge amount about immune response from the HIV epidemic. But early on, remember, in the first two years of the epidemic, we had even no idea what was causing it. We didn't know that it was a virus or a bacteria or something in the lifestyle of gay men. Early on, it was suspected that maybe using poppers, amyl nitrite, was the etiological agent, that that was suppressing the immune system. And so early on, we had no idea what was causing this disease. Yeah, and there's even folks to this day who, who will still emphasize that it was poppers that caused the epidemic. Right. In reviewing your biography and seeing how many patients were literally dying right in front of you as you were doing this critical work early on. How did you, as someone running these clinical trials, manage not only the professional impact of losing patients, lo losing participants, but also the personal impact of witnessing so many deaths? I, I can't answer that question because it, it, just as if you ask someone who lived through a major war, you know, how did you live through something, watching everybody you love and care for and the men around you die. And they say, I don't know, you just you, you just function, you have to. And so th that's the answer. It, it, it was mm -hmm. a very, very tough period of time for everyone because we were losing not only our, our patients, all of these patients were my patients, but we were losing our patients. They were our friends. In many cases, they were our lovers. Thank you for putting it that way. I. I couldn't even imagine, and, and I, a lot of folks my age and younger have no idea what that even was, and um, yet we live with, I think, the weight uh, and the fear that that manifested in society, and so um, I just, I try to bring folks on who, who have had that experience and kind of, can kind of make that link between our generation, because and a lot of time, a lot of times that's kind of lost and, in conversation. And it is lost. But the thing that's important as gay men who've had that experience, either those of us that lived through it or in your generation, those of you who have inherited this, we have a perspective that we can share with society that can make society better. The, in my view, the important lessons was here, here was an epidemic we were not prepared for. 
it hit a, 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 a stigmatized group. Sometime we should talk about the stigma. I mean, while we, while we were watching our friends die, a large part of society was saying they brought it on themselves. If they hadn't lived that lifestyle, they wouldn't have gotten it. And so mm -hmm. that, that was actually, in many cases, harder than the day-to-day -day watching people die was watching society stand by and watch them die. But as gay men, we have learned a great deal from this epidemic. And yet, what did we do to get ready for the next epidemic? Because COVID came along 20 years later. What did we do to get ready for COVID? Nothing. And now mm. what have we done with from COVID? What have we learned from that to get ready for the next one? Everyone just pretends these things have happened in a vacuum and never going to happen again. We're not taking lessons from these things. And that's, that's the legacy that young gay men should take from this, is we should advocate for our society to do more to be prepared for the next one of these tragedies. And let me enlarge that point a little bit. Yeah. As you mentioned early on, AIDS killed 94% of the guys that got it. If you had caught AIDS in 1982, 83, 84, and you came to me and I said, you have Kaposi's sarcoma, that means you're infected with HIV, I was telling you, you were going to die. And you knew that. Mm. With the COVID epidemic, it only killed early on about two and a half percent, put somewhere between two and three percent of the people who got it. What if COVID had killed 30 percent of the people who got it? Our society would have collapsed. I mean, it almost collapsed as it was. And yet we're doing absolutely nothing to prepare for the next epidemic. That's such a good point. And also in talking about things that we haven't learned, there was such, I think, a trust that was broken between community and healthcare, between government officials, between people who are supposed to be kind of the stewards of making sure that as a society we're, we're functioning and we're taking care of ourselves. And I saw that play out during COVID too, the amount of distrust that has come out of that situation. I, I, I don't even, do you have any kind of, where, like how do we remedy that moving forward for the next time? I, I can't answer your question, which is an excellent question. How do we remedy it? But your point is well taken. And I don't know if you've read Randy Schultz's book and the band played on. Um, but in that book, Randy makes the point that we had all of these institutions in place to deal with an epidemic. We didn't know what epidemic was coming, but we had institutions in place. We had the CDC. We had the NIH. We had the, the uh, public health system. We had the press. We had the, the churches as institutions of uh, providing care for community. All of these institutions were there, and every single one of them failed. All of them said, we don't want to be involved in this. And the next thing you knew, a large percentage of our population, young gay men, were dying. At one point in the epidemic, the, the mo most common cause of death for young men in America, all men, was the HIV epidemic because it was killing gay men you know, in, in huge numbers. We, we lost 800,000 boys. In San Francisco, we lost, in a town of... 800,000 people, we lost 36,000 men. Yeah, that's, um, I, like I said, I can't, I can't even fathom it. That's the, that's the blessing is you don't have to fathom it because we got a pill. And the, the pill, of course, makes a young gay guy today not only able to live with the disease and have a normal lifespan, but to use PrEP to protect his sexual partners from getting the disease as well. That's great. But think about the rest of the world. I mean, we're privileged in America to have access to treatment and to prevention. But for the vast majority of people in the world, if you're a young boy in Africa and you're infected with HIV, you don't have the resources to treat yourself, much less provide pre-exposure prophylaxis for your partner. Yeah, it's interesting for me, my experience, I was diagnosed in 2012. And initially I was diagnosed with HIV. And I, I mean, I knew I was taught how to avoid um, getting a diagnosis, how to avoid STIs in general, common safer sex practices. But I was never taught in all those years what happens if you do get a diagnosis and what what 
options are available to you and what your life might look like. So I was under the impression I was going to be dead in two to three years and immediately went through the, okay, what am I going to do? I, I came back a week later on my 27th birthday and then I was diagnosed with AIDS. And I'm like, okay, well, that's it. So I've got two, three years and then I'm done. So what do I do with my life now? So I did ha kind of have that moment of like, wow, the impact of it without, because I didn't have the education before realizing, oh, hey, wow, there is this. I think at the time it was two to three pills that I took um, that completely changed everything within, within six to nine months. Well, and to pick up on your point, right now in America, we have people who are HIV positive who are on treatment. That's a large percentage. We have people that are HIV positive that don't know it. Now, they're out there tonight having sex and transmitting it, but they've not been tested. We could test them. I mean, we, we could have a program in America where we tested everybody and then offered them treatment, and we could stop the epidemic in this country. But there's no, there's no interest in doing that. But do you know that 20% of the people out there who are HIV positive and know it are not on treatment? The very thing you're saying, they don't either know what to do, they don't know how to access it, they think it costs too much, they don't have the information. And whose problem is, whose, whose failing is that? Is that theirs or is that our government failing to educate our people? Absolutely. You made su you make such a good point about testing everybody. Gosh, like that is so simple to routinize something like that with routine doctor's visits. You just get a test. It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is. You just test and that would instantly take away the stigma and then the concern of like, if you are worried about having HIV, well, I don't want to be seen in a clinic. Well, I don't want to be seen going here or there getting tested or having to deal with any of that. It's just part of Part of everybody's life. yeah that's so well, profound wait, well wait take <laughs> take it a step further don't just test people when they see the doctor everybody who gets a driver's license gets a buckle swab so you could test the entire society in a period of about a year or two very very quickly every time you renew your driver's license there's an automatic offer for we'd like to hiv test you okay and then take it one step further who should pay for that the drug companies the drug companies are making a fortune treating patients for HIV. And for every patient they find that's positive, they make even more money. Wow. I've, I've never heard that put before, and it makes so much sense. Um, I, I, can, I can instantly hear the pushback of a portion of society that says, oh, that's Big Brother, that's an invasion, that's, you know... The politicization of all of that, that that is so prevalent, especially now. Yeah, that's too woke for them. Exactly. Okay, so I'll, I'm going <clears> to <throat> change direction here a little bit because I noticed that um, though, though California legalized the use of medical marijuana in 1986, federally it wasn't, it hadn't been legalized. Um, it hasn't been legalized. And in 2002, you were the lead plaintiff in the Conant v. Walters trial, which led to the judicial decision to protect the First Amendment right of physicians to recommend the use of medical marijuana to people living with HIV and AIDS. What, how, did that, how did you get wrapped up in that? What prompted the trial? Was there recourse happening from the federal government? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah again, something you don't know that you should. It was during, believe it or not, a de Democratic Clinton administration, but they decided that they would criminalize doctors talking to patients about marijuana. Barry McCaffrey, the general that you see on TV from time to time, you know, a very bright guy, had been made the drug czar, and he pro proclaimed during the Clinton administration that they would punish doctors if they, rec if they discussed marijuana. It wasn't that you could we were recommending it. Theoretically, if you just said it's a bad thing, you shouldn't do it. It was if you talked about marijuana. Now, and the way they were going to punish doctors, because remember, you're licensed by a state, not by the federal government. So the feds can't take away your license. But what they can do is take away your right to see Medicare patients. And if they take away your right to see Medicare patients, they're taking away your right to earn a living. OK, so they had a way of punishing doctors. Now, again, this was under a Democratic administration, not a Republican administration. There were concerns. 
this was a period in time when Monica Lewinsky had had an affair with President Clinton, and they were trying to persuade her, uh, Ms. Tripp, I believe her name was, was trying to persuade Monica to wear a boire to entrap the president in admitting that he had had sex with her. Now think about it. You're a doctor. The patient comes in into your waiting room and close the door. And the patient says, doctor, I have HIV and I'm throwing up every night. And I'm not hungry and I'm losing weight. And I've heard that smoking a joint will increase my appetite. Is that true? And I say, yeah, that's true. I've, I've had to 20 patients that tell me that. Furthermore, I did the research on Marinol, which is a marijuana derivative, and it increased their appetite. So I've got clinical evidence that it'll increase your appetite. And that patient's wearing a wire, and I could lose my license. That's exactly what we were facing. Well, <clears throat> they approached me to, to be, because I was well known, you know, as an advocate and a patient's advocate to, to be involved. And I said, no, I'm too busy taking care of AIDS patients. I haven't got and they, they were having trouble finding someone. Because think about it. As a gay man, I was single. Most most physicians are, have a wife, a practice, and three kids they're planning to send to college. They're not going to take on something like that where they could lose their license. In my case, you know, fine. What are they going to do, put me in prison? Unfortunately, I could move to Europe, you know. I mean, I'm not stuck here. And so finally, I did take it on to agree to become the, the lead plaintiff because it became obvious that somebody had to step up. If everybody just sat down and said, did, did absolutely nothing, that was going to become the law of the land. And so fortunately, it was the, the, the lawsuit. You, you, no, you, no one can support a lawsuit like that. It was supported by the Soros Foundation. They funded all of the lawyers for that. And it went to trial in San Francisco, not only... To, to punish me for, and the, the, the other people that had signed on, for saying that we thought it was wrong. But they had asked me in deposition, had I ever recommended that a patient smoke marijuana? And I said, yeah, I have. And they were going to charge me with aiding and abetting a felony, which could send me to prison. The court in San Francisco, which is a very liberal court, said doctors have a right to talk to patients. This is a First Amendment right. And therefore, the the felony charge is moot because he, he did something that was acceptable. The government appealed it. It went to the appellate court. They upheld it. It went to the Supreme Court, and they said, we're not going to hear it, which meant it was the end of it. That's the history there. It's fascinating, and that's what got the right for physicians to talk to patients, hopefully about anything that the patient wants to talk about. Incredible. And I know you said you know, somebody had to step up, but I don't think that's a given. And I think it takes a certain kind of character to actually be willing to step up and do that. So hats off to you. And I appreciate also you emphasizing that it was m multiple times that it was under a democratic administration that this happened because um, it's not political and it's not just limited to one side. And um, there's this misunderstanding that happens all around and it's important to be aware of that and to not just assume that because Democrats are in power or um, someone has progressive beliefs that that our understanding of HIV AIDS and, and taking care of our community and, and uh, prevention is necessarily going to happen, that it's a given also. That's right. So fast forwarding to the present, you are currently the chief medical officer at American Gene Technologies, and now also of the new spinoff company, Ad Immune. Can you talk a little bit about what your role is as chief medical officer? Sure. That, that's the easiest question of the morning. <clears throat> the, the researchers do, do the heavy, heavy lifting. The, they do the work to, to get the, the product ready. The job of a chief medical officer is twofold, <clears throat> to work with the researchers to try to implement what they do in a clinical trial in the clinic to get the answers that they need. And also, and probably most importantly, to be sure that that's done in a way that doesn't injure the patients. So, so my job is to work with Jeff Boyle, the, the chief scientific officer, to design the protocol for the next trial. The last trial is just finishing up, as you know from your last interview, and for the next trial, and we're working on that right now. And then, as I say, to monitor it as the trial goes forward, to be certain 
that we're in our view we're not in any way injuring our, our friends and our patients okay so would it be fair to say that the chief science officer is more focused on the logistics aspect and you're you're concerned with the human aspect in a broad sweep, there's truth in that yes what so you work alongside jeff boyle and i assume you work closely with jeff calvin as well sure what's that relationship like it's it's a great relationship because jeff calvin is as you as you know from your interview is an exceedingly bright guy he's one of the brightest guys i've ever had the pleasure of working with and he's a real visionary you know he sees this in the, in the big scope of things he's raised the money to get it done without his his impetus we, we wouldn't be doing this and he's put in place the people that can get it done so it's a delight to work with him and, and we see each other you know on a daily basis when i'm here and folks i had another great interview with jeff calvin also on this channel recently so be sure to check that out as well i'll put a card up here if you haven't seen it so he recently talked about the agt 103t phase one clinical trial he seems very hopeful about how far um how it's gone so far do you share his optimism yes and, and what it's an 87 year old man i wouldn't be here if i didn't i wasn't optimistic about this thing and so yeah yes i'm very optimistic about it so the science is good. I mean, you, you know, your audience knows about the Berlin patient, and there have now been five other patients who've been cured by a simple technique of, of blocking the entry of HIV into cells uh, by, by rendering the patient CCR5 deficient, homozygous deficient. And so all we've done is to take that information and then build on it by taking a group of cells, GAG-specific T cells, and rendering them essentially uh, impervious to infection with HIV by blocking uh, CCR5. And we've, in the first study, as, as uh, uh, Jeff Allen told you, what we did was with seven patients, we took their cells, we grew them up and grew up the GAG-specific T cells into huge numbers, you know, over a billion. We injected a lentivirus in there that blocks CCR5, and we put those cells back in patients. Now, that was a safety study. It was not an efficacy study. And the safety study was an unequivocal success. It, uh, their, uh, success in the, that kind of safety study is measured by essentially one parameter. Were there serious adverse events from, the, from what you did? Did patients get sick? Did patients die? And the answer was there was zero. There was not one single serious adverse event. The minor events, like I got a headache, doctor, occurs with any transfusion. So the things that we saw were anticipated, but those were minor events. There were no serious adverse events. Now, from our point of view, from a scientific point of view, uh, even more important was, was our vector still there at the end of the trial? I mean, did what we put in those cells persist or did your body kill it off? And the answer is no, it still persisted. So we put the cells in, it didn't hurt the patient, they still persisted. And then I was brought on to now take the patients off of their medica medications, off their HIV medications, to see if it worked. And we, we, don't have, we don't have a cure, that's for sure. But what we have are indications that yes, our cells are active. They're doing what we think they should do, what we want them to do. So the next trial will build on that we've got it designed essentially there will be three centers in in california two in san francisco one in la where we will test 24 patients with this same construct moving toward a cure for hiv but but let me again remind your audience this will be a cure for people who can afford it who are privileged like you and me we still have to have a, a vaccine or some way to stop this epidemic because there are millions of people worldwide who will not be able to avail themselves of this. Hopefully with this, we will be able financially to then begin to work on the vaccine that we need. Yeah, again, great comment. I would say a large proportion of the amount of comments that I get, uh, especially on those videos that I talked about, AGT 103T and other functional um, cure hopefuls, is that... Um, will it be available where I live and how much will it cost? And there is a general sense of cynicism among a lot of viewers saying, well, we all know it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars or something crazy. So only the privileged few are going to be able to access it.
Well, let me let me pick up on that. <clears throat> let's let's say that it cost a hundred thousand dollars, but let's say that it works for ten years. Now, I'm hoping it'll work for the life of the patient, but just just pick ten years. Right now, it costs thirty thousand dollars a year for drug. Okay, in if it's thirty thousand dollars a year in ten years, that's three hundred thousand dollars. If you can do it for a hundred thousand dollars, you've saved two hundred thousand dollars. That's right. And presumably, a lot of people are living a, long, a lot longer than ten years. That's right. And and we should be able to persuade insurance companies. Hey guys, would you rather pay three hundred thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars? Exactly. And the. Since you're since you made a good comment on that, I, I'm curious to hear um, your opinion on this as well. Um, other folks say there just isn't um, money to be made in a cure, and therefore, you know, the idea that it's gonna it's not gonna be at, at the very least, it's not gonna be pursued as aggressively as it should be. Well, I I, I can point to what Jeff Galvin has done. Jeff Galvin Galvin has raised almost $75 million so far in the 15 years he's been doing this. So there are venture capitalists out there who are willing to put money into looking for a cure because they can see the market that we just described. It, it, doesn't, it, it certainly is not something that's going to be available worldwide, at least not for a long time, but it's certainly something that would make money for investors if we can make it work. Yeah, folks, for those of you watching, really keep that in mind. In order for an investor to be able to to be able to throw in tens of millions of dollars at something, I mean, they're not just expecting to get that money back after two decades. They want to get a profit and return on that investment. So that alone, the fact that investors are interested should give you some sense of evidence that there is there is profit to be made in a cure and that People will, and people are going to be want, want to be the first movers on that. I mean, the, the first person to come out with a cure has a huge advantage as well. That's right. That's absolutely right. So what are your hopes and aspirations in the years to come with regard to AGT and more specifically with Adimmune? Well, think about it. We, we have huge barriers. We, we first have got to prove that our, our basic product what we're working on right now really works and will get us a new set point. Now, and, and let's expand that a little bit. I mean, what are we really trying to do? We know that when you get infected with HIV, your viral load goes sky high. And then your own body over time brings it down and you plateau at what's called a set point. Mellers back in the late 90s uh, showed that in most patients, that viral set point is about four logs. And it stays there until the bone marrow burns out and then slowly the immune system collapses. Now, patients on drugs don't have to worry about that because you, you're, you don't have a set point. You don't have a measurable viral load. What we're trying to do with this is to establish a new set point, and we're hoping that that set point will be undetectable, the same thing that you get with drugs, that we can set the, the viral load will be so low that you can't measure. But even if it were just, even if it was a 5,000 or 250 or something like that, then the challenge will be, well, how can we make what we're doing work better? What can we do to stimulate more of these cells or, or, or make, make the theory, the, the, the construct that we have more efficacious? So those are all of the challenges. But then think of all of the other things associated with HIV that need to be addressed. The thing that kills patients now is not HIV. It's immune stimulation. It's immune activation. So how can we how can we reduce the immune activation in patients that are HIV positive? And then with Kaposi sarcoma, the, 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 the disease that brought me to this to begin with, Kaposi sarcoma is a virus, it's a herpes virus, that's transmitted from person to person. Okay? You're probably infected with it. I'm probably infected with it. We have HIV negative men right now coming down with Kaposi sarcoma. They have been infected. One of the things that immune can do is work on trying to find a cure for that HIV-associated disease. So there's a whole spectrum of things that we can work on. And when you say immune activation is the thing that kills patients now, what is that? Can you elaborate that a little bit? It, it, it's felt that immune stimulation, immune activation, is the, the, the chronic immune activation is the thing that's causing heart disease, 
that's causing the long-term problems with that, that people that are HIV positive are experiencing. So something that I typically refer to as chronic inflammation. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's such an interest. Yeah. That's such a good point. And it's such an interesting topic for a lot of folks. Um, I would say that it's not really talked about nearly enough by our healthcare providers. I didn't really even know that that was a thing. And I've, I mean, I had a diagnosis in 2012, so 11 years ago, and I only learned about that maybe in the last year or two that that was even a, a potential concern. And for those of us who are plan on living and thriving with HIV, um, that's something that we need to know more about. All right. I think that's true of all of us. The, the problem we have there is there are really no good markers. That, you know, how, how do you measure it? I mean, we know it's yeah. happening, but we don't have really good markers to follow. I was actually speaking with the the London patient, Adam Castillejo, mm-hmm. um, last year. And he's the one who actually mentioned that he was informed that, um, I don't know if it's something like you're three times more likely to develop cancer um, as someone living with HIV. Um, in regards to, to dermatology, do you have any insight there? Uh, no. I, I... Unfortunately, I, I and this is this is embarrassing, but I, you know, as as I get more and more involved in HIV, I move further and further away from from classic dermatology. I, I still follow a little of the literature, but you know, mm-hmm. I'm I'm the wrong dermatologist to ask at this point. Is there anything that we haven't discussed or touched on today that you would like to share with our viewers? No, the, the you know, I think though that some of the things you hit on early on as we were talking, you know, what it was like for gay men at that period of time, but, you know, what it was like to, to be in San Francisco or New York or some of the gay meccas, you, you know, the, the whole gay society has changed tremendously in the 80 years that, that I've lived and, and watched the gay society. Um, it, you know, in the 1960s, gay, out gay men were living in a, I mean, no more than a half a dozen cities in America. Uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, Chicago. Nowadays, you know, gay men are more comfortable living th- throughout the, the whole country. But the people in those cities, it, it was really amazing because in San Francisco, many of my patients tried to go home to their homes in Texas or wherever they had fled from when they realized they were gay and they couldn't live in, in where they had been born. And many of them had to come back to San Francisco because there was no support system for them uh, in, in their hometown. And, and, and that was a tragedy. And I, I don't think anyone really, I don't think it's discussed today that people don't realize what these people went through or how their families, I, I can remember one patient who was a dear friend, and he just loved the fact that his sister had had a, a child and he just wanted to be the uncle of that, to that little boy. And the minute she found out she, he was positive, she never would let him see the kid again. Those kind of horror stories need to be remembered, that that was the society that we had created and that we were living through. Yeah, I had a, I had a personal experience, I think back in 93 or 94, I was eight or nine years old at the time. And I remember my stepdad had a friend come to the house, his name was Randy, um, and he was middle-aged, but he looked sickly and thin, and I remember I saw him the one time he showed up, said hi to my parents, and my my stepdad said not to touch him and not to hug him, and then I never saw him again. Right. And I didn't understand it at the time, but growing up, you know, having that realization was like, wow, that's, I mean, I felt that my heart breaks thinking about, like, just that interaction. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that was, that was not just unique. Those, that was the way society behaved. Which, which was a tragedy. But think about it. When, when I was in my 20s and early 30s, you know, as a gay man, n- no one ever would say, you know, c- come to a party and bring your partner because you couldn't acknowledge that someone was gay so he didn't have a partner. You were a bachelor. We don't have bachelors anymore. We have straight men who are not married, but they're not called bachelors. Un- Uncle Joe, who was a bachelor, was probably a gay man back in the 1950s and 60s. And so that whole thing has changed. They don't exist anymore. Bachelors were invited to come to party 
with some girl that had not gotten married in, from the neighborhood, probably a lesbian. And the two of them, you know, sat there and tried to be very nice during the dinner party. And then after the dinner was over, they, they went their separate ways. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I would never, I, that's the first time I heard that. So thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. And frankly, you're the one who really brought up the social aspect of it and the stigma. I wasn't planning on really touching on that. I didn't, I didn't expect that talking to you as someone who's really heavily into the medical field would um, have that kind sort of connection. So I appreciate you really like digging in and, and, and making sure that we cover that. And I'm so glad we did. I do want to, it's my intention to share more stories like that with my audience. My thinking is always, uh, how do I bring something of value to my audience and, and what can they gain from it? So I personally have a deep desire to dig into that more. Um, for, and this may be unfair to ask of you. You might not have an answer, which is fine. But I'm curious if you have an insight how, how I can make that connection, especially with those who are so focused on on cure, cure, cure. How do I you know, get out of the situation I'm in today to make that value connection for the audience that's so focused on just getting to a cure? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, one of the ways that I can help you is I still have friends who've lived through this epidemic who were there at the time. And you might, we can talk off camera about you interviewing some of those to begin to get perspective from people who actually lived through that period of time. Yeah, that would be amazing. I would love to do that. And for those of you watching, please, in the comments below um, or in DMs, however you end up watching this, let me know if that's something that would be of interest to you and of, of the value and insight that you would get from that as well. I would love to do that. Marcus, there's so much more that I could chat with you and would love to chat with you about, um, but you've been so gracious with your time and um, respectfully, respectfully, it is time to wrap up our conversation today. I'd love to bring you back on at some point. If uh, the opportunity presents itself, we could talk about AGT, we could talk about so many different things. Hopefully the data we get will make it imperative that I come back to tell you that we're we're closer to a cure. Any any time that, that you want to talk about the stigma or what it was like to, you know, we could talk for a, a whole half an hour about what it was like to be told you were HIV positive. Some beautiful 30 year old gay guy who had come to San Francisco, gotten a lover, had gotten a wonderful job and then watch his life just collapse in front of him, you know, as he as he loses weight and gets, you know, that and people just people think that you got AIDS and you died. No, no, you got AIDS and you lived for months slowly wasting away people people forget they don't forget it your generation doesn't even know it oh um before you go um is there anything that you'd like to share with the audience as far as projects that you're working on or self-promotion or if people want to follow you or your work yeah well I, if, if if you want self-promotion <clears throat> the university of california in san francisco has been kind enough to name an endowment for me for gay and lesbian dermatology and I would love you to promote that to your audience because, quite honestly, they need donations if they're going to finance that endowment. Okay. Yeah. In, anyway, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for doing it. Everyone at home, please comment below your thoughts, questions. I'm more than happy to follow up after the fact. This has been such uh, uh, an inspiring interview. Marcus, a huge thank you to you and everything that you're continuing to do. Everyone at home, thank you so much for watching. If you do care to donate or support this channel, I have included a new PayPal link in the description box below, and you can always send super thanks or super comments in the comments below as well. Please like this video if you liked it, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out, and share this video with people in your life who you might think might find this valuable. And be sure, if you haven't watched it already, to check out the AGT 103T announcement video I did, as well as the interview with CEO Jeff Galvin. Cheers, everyone. Take care.